Good morning, everyone. This morning, we'll be finishing this short series on the what we generally think of as the motto of the Ramakrishna order, Atmano Makshatam Jagadhitaya Cha, that we are striving for our own liberation or realization. And uh, we also are working for the welfare of the world. So this is, this is the motto that was coined by uh, Swami Vivekananda. Uh, we don't have much history about uh, how he came up with this. Did he hear it somewhere? A little bit similar to uh, old Buddhist phrase, Bahujana Hitaya, Bahujana Sukhaya. Uh, but we know that uh, he mentioned this just before the founding of the Ramakrishna Martin Mission in 1897 on May 1st, and when there was uh, uh, the first batch of new monks of the order, that he, he made an address to them. This is just before the, uh, the very end of, of the April. And uh, I'll, I'll read uh, what he said. This was taken down by Swamiji's disciple, Sharachandra Chakravarti. So uh, he is, is very accurate because after M, he may have been one of the best to, with, in terms of memory and recording everything. We have that whole long section uh, that uh, conversations between Swamiji and his disciple. This is that same Bangal. So that uh, he, he's written that Swamiji said, remember the sannyasi is born in the world atmano moksha tam jagad hitayacha for the salvation of his own soul and for the good and happiness of the many. Now Swamiji would have said all of this in, in Bengali. So this is an English translation of it. To sacrifice his life for others, to alleviate the misery of millions rending the air with their cries, to wipe away the tears from the eyes of the widow, to console the heart of the bereaved mother, to provide the ignorant and depressed masses with the ways and means for the struggle for existence, and to enable them to stand on their own feet, to preach, broadcast the teaching of the scriptures to one and all without discrimination for their material and spiritual welfare, to rouse the sleeping lion of Vedanta in the hearts of all beings by the diffusion of the light of knowledge. For this, the sannyasi is born in the world. So this is the motto and, and pledge, you could say, that we take as sannyasis, but it was also meant uh, to serve as a general ideal for the devotees as well, as, as monks. So we went through this the first two times. This is a little bit of a, a review in the beginning. Uh, but we know that when uh, Swamiji introduced this during the first meeting in Balaram Bose's house, when they uh, came up with this idea of, of organizing the order and having the trustees and everything, that uh, it was not readily accepted by everyone. Now, at first, at first sight, we can think that who will possibly object to this? That is striving for liberation and, and trying to help other people. But uh, there were certain elements of this that, uh, f at least for us, need to be looked at a little carefully to understand both why there were some objections or hesitation and also why ultimately uh, all of these uh, objections can be really uh, eliminated and why this is such a, uh, an important and beautiful uh, ideal for all of us to follow. Little bit of an objection we can say to the first part, which we discussed last session that uh, Sri Ramakrishna never emphasized this idea of getting out of this round of birth and death, this idea, this very typical idea uh, of, of moksha or mukti, that it was always the, the goal of life was God realization. Sometimes he even said the goal of life, life is devotion bhakti, attainment of, of bhakti. Uh, so we don't hear too much of this idea, let me not be born again, this world is full of suffering, uh, some Buddhist traditions will emphasize that, but for Sri Ramakrishna, uh, it, was, it was more here and now. So we have this idea of 
Jivan Mukti as opposed to Videho Mukti, final liberation, that we can say this, this more or less will, will take care of the first part of the objection at all. But even Swamiji himself was not very much in favor of uh, even, even striving for one's own realization uh, if it represented a, a bit of a selfish uh, attitude and not caring for others. So uh, we'll, we'll get to all of these a little bit, but the main uh, question this, for this session will be, well, what about the second part? Now, Sri Ramakrishna himself did not uh, emphasize very much there was devotees, that type of social reform uh, that the Brahma Samaj did, or the type of work that Vidyasagar did, although he, he respected it very much, but his emphasis was more uh, find that treasure hidden within. So this is one aspect of it, and uh, the other thing is that Swamiji emphasized preaching so much, and Sri Ramakrishna was very clear that unless one gets the command of God, that it won't do much good, that it's, uh, he had a great objection to just these pundits. In those days, people were giving lectures in the right and left. It was a very common thing. And uh, Sri Ramakrishna used to say that not much is, is gained through all of this, that the people will hear it, they'll say, ooh ah, ooh ah, for a few days and then forget everything. Yeah, that he used to say, it's like uh, a little drop of cold water on a very hot frying pan. It'll sizzle and make a little bit of noise, and then it's gone. That was a nice uh, example that he gave. Yeah, so we, we can see objection from orthodox quarters, objection from his own uh, the, the devotees of Sri Krishna, and even Swamiji himself. Even Swamiji himself uh, emphasized certain things that seem to go against this a, a little bit. Because after all, he was following the teachings of, uh, of Sri Krishna. So uh, Swamiji himself did not emphasize this idea of mukti or liberation. He called it something very small-minded. He really looked upon it uh, as something a little bit selfish. He emphasized perhaps more the second half, this uh, selflessly working for the welfare of others. Now, what is the, the distinction? Uh, working for the welfare of others and working for the welfare of the world. If we, if we want to say that uh, no one will make this world perfect, we know that, everybody knows that. And uh, some people will even object that uh, these people are suffering because of their karma. And because of that karma, uh, they're suffering that they'll get rid of that, this will be helpful for them, don't disturb them that way. Swamiji would get angry at that. He says, but if it's their karma to, to suffer, it's my karma to help them. Yeah, so he didn't much care for that type of, uh, of objection. And of course, we'll see that service done in the, in the proper spirit is the, the best way to help us towards freeing ourselves from selfishness and all, all sorts of other types of things. So uh, Swamiji also wanted us to feel that freedom within. And this type of social service work sometimes can lead to a type of bondage and attachment to the world. So there are, are all of these uh, very legitimate questions that will come up. And uh, we read, I think, the first session, I read about the reaction that uh, some of Swamiji's brother disciples had, Swami Yogananda and Swami Adbhutananda, that uh, Sri Ramakrishna never preached these things. And the, are these your own ideas, something you picked up in the West? Are these sort of Christian missionary types of ideas? See, they even use the word Ramakrishna mission. Where did they get this from? This would be, yeah, it was a very common idea. Not that they wanted to be missionaries in the sense of trying to convert everyone, but the Christian mis missions and missionaries were originally supposed to help people also. So anyhow, Swamiji didn't mind uh, if he borrowed some ideas from other quarters. The, the Buddhist traditions, they also, the old Buddhist monks, did some type of, of social service work in the sense that they would try to cure people. They did things, uh, they had educational institutions, uh, early days and everything. So, so we, we see that there is some scope for confusion 
and what looks like certain types of contradictions that uh, on the one hand, seeking one's own liberation has the potential to bind us and uh, make us a, a little bit selfish and not care for other people. And on the other hand, working for the welfare of others, there's that possibility, some sense of ego comes that uh, we feel that we can change the world and we can do everything. So uh, everything has to be balanced a little bit. So I want to concentrate uh, on the second part of this, uh, working for the welfare of others. From an orthodox point of view, the uh, monastic tradition in India, aside from the very early Buddhist tradition, the monastic tradition in India uh, was very much removed from society. That uh, the monks, for the most part, would try not to have too much interaction with others, that uh, very often they would go into deep mountain caves and go to the Himalayas and everything and do their spiritual practice. Uh, for Shankaracharya, there's tremendous emphasis on this idea that in the beginning, uh, we do some type of karma yoga until we, we reach the point where we're ready to renounce. And then after that, uh, we engage ourselves strictly in this jnana yoga. And even in the path of devotion, that uh, uh, even then, we lessen our duties in the world. See, even, even Sri Ramakrishna spoke in these terms. He gives the example of the daughter-in-law and the, and the household. When she becomes pregnant, but ready to have a child, that month by month, the mother-in-law reduces her duties so that when she gets towards the uh, time of, of delivery, she has nothing to do no outside duties to do, and then the child is born, she simply cares for the child. So we have this kind of uh, idea that we see that even in Gita, uh, we'll, we'll have some verses that talk about the two-tier theory, uh, that uh, in the beginning, when we're trying to reach some higher stage of spirituality, then it says, karma karma uchyate then we have to perform action in the world. This is our karma yoga. But once we've reached that plateau and we want to go up to the, all the way to the roof, then shama karma uchade, then we, we withdraw and we turn within. So this is a very standard type of thing. And Sri Ramakrishna, uh, he also spoke in those terms. Now, those who take sannyasa uh, theoretically, should be ready to be at that higher stage where they can renounce work. And, uh, but Swamiji, he understood two things. One is that uh, the monks of our order will join when they're young. Uh, the, the old uh, tradition was uh, after going through the householder stage of life, one becomes a sannyasi, all desires are finished at that point. So, uh, for our benefit, if we don't keep busy and active and do some very uh, positive type of work, selfless type of work, that uh, it won't be good for us. And he also understood that uh, there was a role to play to help society. And uh, there's a difference between thinking, yeah, I'll change the world, and thinking, let me see if I can be of benefit to even a single individual. It'll be, it'll be a very nice thing. Now, Swamiji has a lecture that uh, we can help the world, we can only help ourselves. Yeah, I hate that title. And I, and I don't think that he meant it the way that, that it seems like he meant it at all. If our incentive to help somebody else is to help ourselves and we think I'm not really helping them, then it's 100% selfish, yeah. Suppose uh, we decide to go and, and serve at a soup kitchen and somebody says, you think you're really helping these people? I, say, I don't care, I'm doing it, I want to help myself. Now what kind of so <laughs> service is that? <laughs> it's the exact opposite of Swamiji, want, what, what he wanted. I think what Swamiji was trying to say was that don't have any arrogance, don't take any pride in what you're doing. And of course, 
to see God and what you're doing, do it as worship and everything, but don't think you're going to change the world. Have a little humility and know that, yeah, you'll benefit from this. There's no question about that, but that can't be our motive in helping other people that uh, will spiritually benefit from that. I, I used to think, you know, sometimes we'll do something, we'll go to a soup kitchen, we'll come back, and uh, we'll feel good about ourselves. A little warm, fuzzy feeling that we did a little service. I would think, how would Swamiji feel if he went to a soup kitchen and for two hours he served some food and came back? Would he, would he feel pleased with himself? And that, oh, I helped myself spiritually. He'd be, be weeping to see uh, the condition that people have come into and how helpless we are to make any real change for it. So uh, I don't think that Swamiji meant that in the way that it can be construed. I think what he was really trying to say is uh, don't have any arrogance, don't think you're really helping. Plus, look at it as worship. Look at, at this as worship or see the same self dwelling within all beings. Yeah. So he had both attitudes, that uh, we're really helping ourselves. That means really helping ourselves dwelling in other beings also. We can take it uh, that way. But there's no question that if we do this type of service uh, with no personal interest, selfish interest, that it'll be beneficial for us. There's no question about that. This is the whole point behind uh, this, this whole idea of, of karma yoga. When Sri Ramakrishna spoke about these things, very often it was in the context of the Brahma Samaj. So we know that they were real, really interested in social reform. They had, of course, their spiritual side. It wasn't simply social reform, but uh, Sri Ramakrishna felt that it was overemphasized. So uh, I, I understand a lot of the things that Sri Ramakrishna says in terms of corrections. It may sound like he's a little bit too strong on one side, uh, but it's to, to correct some attitude that people have uh, prejudice from the other side. So if it sounds like he's, he's so much against working for the very legitimate things, this uh, uh, getting rid of caste distinctions or prejudice against the women and uh, widows, and everything, these are all very positive things, and Sri Ramakrishna appreciated them, with uh, Vidyasagar especially, he, he didn't say that uh, this is, he's, he's caught in Maya, that uh, there's no benefit in anything. He said the work that Vidyasagar is doing is good. It's sattvic work. It, it, it's born of daya, of compassion. But he did it at the expense of, of uh, really taking time to go deep within himself. This is, was his only objection. He said the work that he does is good, but he doesn't know there's gold hidden deep within himself. So that was the main, uh, the main reason for that. Uh, so this was with regard to the social service work, but also with lecturing, uh, there was tremendous objection. Uh, some of Swamiji's own disciples, Swami Virajananda, that uh, Swamiji said, I want to send you to East Bengal. You start uh, lecturing. He said, what do I know? I don't know anything, Swamiji. What have I achieved? He said, then you tell them that. They'll be impressed with that. Yeah, we all have this problem when we're asked to start giving talks. Uh, everybody I know, maybe a few exceptions who, who wanted to, most of us don't like to do it. And uh, uh, we all have that objection, but where's our badge of authority? What have we realized? So generally we're told that we don't consider ourselves lecturers. We're trying to explain the ideas of Sri Krishna and Holy Mother and Swamiji and everything. So we had some who objected. We had some who immediately caught the spirit of Swamiji, especially with this uh, social service type of work. Swami Akandananda had a special relationship with Swamiji that for some reason, uh, Swamiji had a special affection for him. He writes in one of his letters that uh, it seems like I love you almost too much. A very beautiful letter that he wrote to him. And when Swamiji wanted to travel all alone throughout India uh, and during that Parivarajika period, that uh, this um, Gangadhar, he used to call him Ganges, Swami Akarnananda, 
that he was the one that Swamiji didn't mind traveling with and even said at one time that Ganges, you've been all through Tibet and everything, I don't know these places, you, you take me to these places. So they, they traveled together quite a bit. But he uh, did such tremendous work uh, with the, first of all the very uh, poor, uneducated, low caste uh, children in, in Ketri, and then later, of course, with his orphanage in Sargachi. We'll get to this uh, uh, a little bit later also. And then we see uh, Swamiji's disciples, that uh, Swami Kalyanandi and Swami Nishchayanandi, uh, how they did such tremendous work with uh, the sick, ailing, dying sadhus in Rishikesha hardware area. So there are many of them that had some objections. Swami Premananda, that uh, his, his story is very, very interesting, that uh, he always uh, butted heads with Swamiji a little bit, even though they had a beautiful, sweet, loving relationship. This is, this is uh, from the outside, it looks contradictory and hard for us to understand how Swami could get angry, Swamiji get angry at some of his brother disciples, and then afterwards himself would be weeping and begging their forgiveness. He was such an emotional person, but uh, they had that type of relationship. Now, the Swami Premananda, uh, he wasn't so quick to pick up on this idea of this uh, doing relief work in, in hospitals and all of these things, but he had an illness, very serious illness. I think it was around uh, 1918, something like that, anyhow, uh, where he was practically bedridden. And at that time, he read all of the complete works of Swami Vivekananda, what, whatever was available, probably the Bengali translation. And he said it caused tremendous revolution in his mind, so much so that after that, he almost exclusively spoke about uh, serving others as worship of God, and sometimes would refer to himself as, now I'm Swamiji's disciple. Of course, right, he was Ramakrishna's disciple, but, uh, so many of them were a little slow. Uh, M, and, and I'll also get to that with Holy Mother, he was very slow to do it. But the interesting thing is that they had such tremendous respect and regard, reverence, we can say, for Swamiji, partly because they recognize his brilliance, they recognize his spiritual stature, but also because Sri Ramakrishna uh, made it very, very clear. Henceforth, I'll, I'll live with him, within him. Henceforth, it, he'll be the leader that uh, you follow him. And uh, I guard him very carefully. Make sure no harm comes to him. He's uh, so precious. If he comes to know his real nature, he may give up the body. So they, they all somehow implicitly knew he was to be followed, but they were honest people. They would express it if they didn't understand well, why he was emphasizing things that it seemed a little different from what Sri Ramakrishna said. So these were some of the uh, objections uh, that we see that uh, uh, and some of them, uh, of course, Swamiji agreed with. Uh, Thakur used to say that, uh, how are you trying to fix the world? It's like straightening the curly tail of a dog that will fix it, or, or something like uh, this chronic uh, rheumatism. They say you, you have it in the elbow, you cure it there, it shows up in the hip. That it just goes from one place to another. That you straighten out the tail of the dog and it gets curly again. So Swamiji understood all of these things and spoke about them also, used the same examples. But we have to think that, uh, does this mean that if somebody comes to us who's in need, that we can help somebody, that we won't do it? No, it means that uh, this world will go on with its ups and downs and goods and bad, but that uh, we should feel the priv privilege if we can do anything, some small thing like that. So yes, there will always be an equal amount of happiness and misery in the world. Swamiji once said, if anything, there's going to be more misery than happiness in this world. We have to accept that. But at the same time, 
uh, Swamiji would never use that as a as, uh, uh, reason not to help people. Uh, he, his whole life was dedicated to, to helping others. In fact, this is why the avatar is born, uh, for the benefit of others, not for his own sake, or not a, any of the uh, direct disciples. So, uh, this, this working for the welfare of the world is not any type of, of uh, social service type of work that uh, uh, will, will just be patch up types of things. It has to be done as worship. And this is, again, something that Sri Ramakrishna uh, gave as a gift to Swamiji. This idea, don't look upon uh, this work as anything other than the highest type of worship. So this was Swamiji's emphasis. He used to call this the worship of the living God. He said, you can go to a temple, bow down before the image. Why, why are you going to this, this clay image or marble, whatever it is, when God is standing before us in all of these different forms, begging for a morsel of food? What's the highest type of worship? Feed that person. So uh, this was something that uh, Swamiji got directly from Sri Ramakrishna. And little by little, uh, I think they all began to understand this. Swami Akhandananda, as I say, was the first. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about the work that he did in, in uh, Sargachi. So if we really analyze it, they were making objections based on things that Sri Ramakrishna said, but Swamiji understood the significance of, of Thakur's words better than any of them, especially with regard to this uh, working for the welfare of the world. Yes, if you look at it that way, it's not a high ideal. If you look at it as a type of worship of, of God dwelling within all beings, then it's the highest type of, of ideal. Now, this idea of not appropriate for monks to perform social service work. This was a, as I say, an orthodox uh, ideal that at the most monks could give some spiritual instruction, have some disciples, uh, keep that tradition alive that way. But uh, among the orthodox, there was a great objection to this. And uh, we know this mostly through the work that was done by the two Swamis that I mentioned, the Swami uh, Kalyanandji and Swami Nishchayanandji that uh, Swamiji himself went to the very the two be the beloved disciples. He went to the Swami Kalyananji and he said, look, there are all these sadhus that they go and they live in Rishikesh and, uh, and Hardwar, and there's no one to look after them. Many of them were just dying without anyone to serve them. You go and serve them and do it as, of course, the highest type of, of worship. So they went there and uh, they were looked down upon by the very sadhus that they were serving. There was one particular incident where a feast was arranged. They, they have these bhandaras. Yeah. That there will be a feast that will be in some, some pious householder will donate some money and he'll, he'll tell the, some of the big sadhus, you arrange something and, and invite all of the sadhus there and there'll be a big feast, we'll give some gifts, they'll get uh, some money or some cloth, something like that. And uh, so there was one occasion where this was done. And there was one very highly revealed, revered monk uh, from a different order. His name was Dhanraj Giri. He was the founder of this Kailash Ashram, very famous uh, ashram in the, that area, Kankal. So he was there, he invited there, and all of the other monks are there. And he looked at them and said, where are those two? Uh, which two? The ones that serve you when you're sick, the ones who look after you. And they, they said, uh, we didn't invite them. Why? He said, they do all sorts of things. The bhangi sadhus, that they have to clean bedpans and everything. That they do the work of scavengers, outcast type of work. How can we invite them? So this Dhanaraj Giri, he was really a very great soul. He said, these are the people who serve you and you won't sit with them for a meal. He said, I won't eat unless you invite them. Now, in, in, uh, there are certain traditions 
among sadhus where there's kind of a hierarchy. Those who are given the greatest reverence and honor, they'll get to sit closer to the front or the time of uh, Kumbh Mela, they'll be the ones who got to get to bathe first or something. So we said, you not only invite them, you have them sit next to me. He was, uh, so that changed everything there. And uh, of course we know that now it's a big hospital in Konkol, they do so much wonderful work. But these two disciples of, of uh, Swamiji's were so dedicated. And the Swamiji was very, very happy with the work that they did. Uh, Swami Kalyanandji, he never left, he never went back to Belarmat. He said, Swamiji sent me here. Yeah, so uh, really their dedication was amazing. This Swami Nishtayananda, he was a military man. This is a, this is a little off, off the point, but a nice story about him. He was one, if Swamiji said something, that was it. So Swamiji, one day, he said, we need a cow for the monastery in Belarmat. So uh, there's one that can be bought on the uh, other side, the Calcutta side of uh, Ganges. You go and, and don't let go of the rope of this cow. The cow may try to run away. So they, they bought the cow and they're coming back on the boat. He's holding onto the rope and the cow jumps over. So he holds on, he jumps over also. Then they both disappear. They don't find them and everyone goes back and they tell Swamiji, uh, it looks like our Nishchananda Swami, he must have died. He went over, we don't know if he can swim, anything like that. And then some hours later, they see him soaking wet <laughs> with the cow holding the rope and coming back and showing Swamiji. And Swamiji gave him a big scolding and also praised him, was very happy. Yeah. So, yeah, Swamiji wanted his disciples to be like that. He said, I tell you to jump off the building, you jump first and then ask me why later. Yeah. So they were so, so tremendously uh, devoted to him. So Swamiji understood that uh, uh, as Sri Ramakrishna said, that first we want this purification, then you can withdraw from work, but this, this purification that comes through this type of, of selfless service is a lifelong thing for most of us. And this is why it was so helpful for the, for the monks of the order. And uh, it leads to devotion also. It's not just that uh, we're doing it to purify ourselves, but uh, anything that leads to selflessness. This, of course, for Swamiji, this was the highest ideal. Yeah. He made that great statement, they alone live who live for others. The rest are more dead than alive. It was such a tremendous statement. So uh, that, that was such a strong point uh, uh, for Sw Swamiji. So, and, and, and those who take to this path of jnana yoga, they have to see the self dwelling within others also. One thing I find very interesting in, in when we read Bhagavad Gita, that there's a particular phrase, sarva bhutahiterata, engaged in the welfare of all beings, uh, this, this idea, rata, it means engaged. It also means taking some joy out of it. It has both meanings. Each time it applies to the jnani, not to the bhakta. We think that jnani is withdrawn from everything. But even in, in Gita, this will be those who have that higher knowledge. They'll see God dwelling in all beings. They'll want to be en engaged. This is what Thakur liked. He wanted this type of, uh, of engagement. Now, when it comes to the type of, of beneficial work that can be done for society. Generally, there's a, a particular order to this, that the jnana dana, there's a gift of, of spiritual wisdom will be the highest. And then any type of secular education, vidya dana, this will also be uh, just below that. The lowest is held to be this anna dana, that helping to feed people. But for Swamiji, uh, he saw how much of, of poverty there was in India when he traveled around as a, a, a wandering sadhu before he started this, initiated the order and everything. Uh, it broke his heart to see so many people that uh, uh, were just struggling to have enough food to even live, to eat. So he emphasized very much this idea that uh, give them food first. He said that uh, what an insult it is to stuff religion down their throats when they're dying for a piece of bread. 
So first, first feed them, raise them up, give them their dignity. Then they'll be ready for some type of, uh, of spirituality. He said even luxury for the poor, a little bit of luxury so they can at least have that experience and, and know uh, how far it, it will take them. But he always said you teach them to raise themselves. So he emphasized first feeding them and then vidya, then, then education. And then the spirituality will automatically come. I mentioned Swami Akandananda. I just want to say a few words about him because uh, he embodied the ideal that uh, Swamiji wanted to see uh, more than any of them. The, the work that he did in Sargachi uh, was something really tremendous and he didn't go about looking for anything. He, he wandered about, he wandered all over India, all over Tibet. He was a very fearless type of person. When he, when he got to this area, the Moshidabad area, and the Sargachi, there was a terrible famine at that time. And uh, he just felt that call that uh, he wouldn't abandon them because what happened was uh, very often parents would die uh, from the famine of starvation and the children would be orphans there. So uh, for him, this was uh, something that uh, just broke his heart. And he made a vow that uh, he wouldn't leave that place until he could do something for them. And we'll get to the story of Paranti Deva in a minute. He, he, he really took a vow that he himself would not eat. He wouldn't take any rice or any of that. Of course, was considered the main staple unless there was some for the, for the others. So he went for, for months, uh, just barely living on meager, some boiled greens and, and things like that. And uh, uh, gradually help came from other places and uh, he started the, uh, an orphanage there. And a very good percentage of them were Muslim children also. The, the area is right next to the border uh, near what's now the Bangladesh. So uh, he worked tirelessly for them. He loved these children like his very own. Even when he became president of the order, he never wanted to leave the Sargachi. They would have to drag him to Belermat, and he would always like to go back uh, and, and stay there. So uh, others caught the spirit. Uh, so we see again the Swami Kalyanandi and others. And uh, uh, Swami Virjanandi. OK, I mentioned him very briefly before how we hesitated uh, to do this type of uh, lecturing work. He was also asked to go to America at one time, and, and he didn't want to do that either. That was, of course, much later. But uh, when, when he uh, had his more mature view was that what Swamiji was doing was, was really instituting some very special new type of, of uh, way to look at spiritual life and a new brand of sannyasi. Now, of course, it's, it's very common. Almost every big guru and every spiritual movement will have their own hospital and dispensary and everything. In those days, it wasn't, wasn't like that. But I want to read what he wrote uh, in the, Towards the Goal Supreme. These were actually recorded statements that he made at different times. Swamiji, having received hints from Sri Ramakrishna as to how this great truth, that means worshiping God and man, could be practically applied in the daily lives of both householders and sannyasis without distinction. He proclaimed to the world his path of serving all beings by seeing Narayana in them. He insisted that by practice, the Vedanta doctrine of the identity of Jiva and Brahman can be directly perceived and applied to the service of man with the object of teaching mankind that the ideal of one's own salvation and doing good to the world is not only not self-contradictory, but mutually helpful, he established the Ramakrishna Mutt and mission. So mutually helpful, 
we, we selflessly work for the benefit of others, that it helps us spiritually. And we do our spiritual practice that enables us to, uh, to serve others selflessly. And it also enables us to be an example for others. Then again he wrote, this Nara Narayana worship, that means worshiping on both as that infinite absolute reality and as manifested in human beings. This Nara Narayana worship instituted by Swamiji is not merely unselfish, unattached karma for the good of others in order to gain purification of one's heart. See, this was the old idea. And this is, this is a little bit of, of what we seem to get when Swamiji says, we, we don't really help others, we only help ourselves, which I don't like. <laughs> that, uh, here, he's saying that what Swamiji instituted is not that. It's not simply in order to gain purification of one's heart, but it's entirely a new process of sadhana for the realization of the paramatman, the higher self, through the practice of a wonderful harmony of jnana, yoga, bhakti, and karma. How is it bhakti? We see God dwelling in others, personal God. Who is the personal God? God dwelling in human form. The very nice statement that was made by Ramana Maharshi that somebody asked that uh, you believe in a personal God because he was known for this impersonal absolute. He said, who, who is the personal God? He said, whoever says I is the personal God. That means each and every one of us. Huh? So seeing Ishwara, personal God, dwelling within all beings, not simply this light of Atman and everything. So that, that, that aspect of, of bhakti is there. Uh, and jnana, of course, same self dwelling within all beings. So let me read this again. This Nada Narayana worship instituted by Swamiji is not merely unselfish, unattached karma for the good of others in order to gain purification of one's heart, but is entirely a new process of sadhana for the realization of the Paramatman or the highest self through the practice of a wonderful harmony of jnana, yoga, bhakti, and karma. And because, because it is so, it directly leads to the attainment of mukti. Now, whether we like this mukti idea or, or we don't care for it, it'll, it'll lead in the direction of, of freedom. Swamiji, we know, he said, don't care about your own mukti. Yeah, it'll come. He said, yeah, don't run after it. If you don't care for it, it'll run after you. So it's a not, the, uh, of, of course, these great souls, they can also delay it. May I be born again and again, as Swamiji used to say. Anyhow, uh, and because it is so, it directly leads to the attainment of mukti. For in this path, one has to conceive of God through jnana yoga as one's own self. One has to meditate on God through raja yoga as the self within. To be attached to him through bhakti yoga with a wholehearted soul, with whole soul devotion. And through karma yoga, serve him with disinterested, desireless actions. One other example of how Swamiji really wanted to help people, forget about whether it's changing the world or anything like that, how he just, he, he was born with, with just a soft, tremendously tender heart, that the time of plague, and this is something that also involves Swami Akandananda, because at the time of plague uh, in Kolkata, this was, very beginning or end of the 19th century, sometime around then. He also came to Kolkata. And uh, it's very interesting, you know, we have our anti-vaccination people, anti-vaxxers, huh? They had very, very strong at that time that people thought that the government, that meant the British, were spreading plague through the vaccines. Uh, and the Swami Akandananda that, uh, he, he had these leaflets and was on the street and trying to uh, get people to take these vaccines and his life was in danger. They were ready to kill him. They thought, who is this person? How much money are you getting from the, from the government to do all of this? Wearing garo as if you're a sadhu and everything. They were ready to beat him and kill him. He almost died many times. Yeah, in, in Tibet one time, in, in Ketri, working with the poor people, the, uh, 
low caste people, the, the, some of the others tried to kill him then also in yeah, this one instance. But uh, he relates something that Swamiji himself said. You see, we are the children of Bhagavan Sri Ramakrishna, children of divine immortality. We will have to serve those suffering from plague without paying the slightest heed to even fear of death. We will have to provide them with medicine, food, and nurse them, even if it means selling our new Belarmat. So we, we know he made that proposal, and, and Holy Mother said no. We must be prepared to sacrifice our lives for their sake. Come, let us be prepared to leap into the ocean of death, taking his name. We are the children of Bhagavan Sri Ramakrishna, children of divine immortality. How can there be any fear of death for us? Now, <clears throat> if we say that many of Swamiji's brother disciples were surprised and a little slow to understand all of this, the one great exception was the Holy Mother, that uh, uh, she, simple village woman from the outside, but from within, uh, such a clarity of vision and uh, such a wisdom uh, that uh, she never hesitated, and she always felt that uh, what Swamiji was, was doing, that he was really uh, living embodiment of, of the ideal of Sri Ramakrishna. So uh, whenever she was approached, she always backed him very much. Once one of Swamiji's letters was read out to her when Swamiji was in the West. He, most of the letters he wrote back to his brother disciples had to do with uh, his vision of the order, going into the villages and educating poor people and helping them and everything. So she remarked once, Narendra is an instrument in the master's hand. It is the master who is working through Narin. What Narin has said is true. In the future, his words will be fulfilled. And then when he came back to India, she said, the master is always with you. You have many more things to accomplish for the welfare of the world. She was the one who uh, finally convinced M. N was the slowest, probably, of all of them. Uh, because uh, he heard too many times from Sri Ramakrishna that uh, don't worry about uh, uh, trying to change the world, realize God first, and then after you realize God, then work for the welfare of others. So he was very much convinced of all of that. But in 1912, when Holy Mother went on a pilgrimage to Varanasi, he also went there. And there, of course, we have a very large hospital, the Sevashram there, and tremendous work is, is done in all of our hospitals. And really, this idea uh, of serving Narayan and the patients is, is really even literally done. There'll, there'll be uh, occasions where they'll actually go and, and, and practically worship with an oddity, the, the patients. And uh, I've told this story before. One of our, our sadhus there, uh, if any of the others said that they were going to, to uh, serve one of the patients, he would get very annoyed. He said, no you're going to serve Narayana. He would make a very strong point about that. And he himself, he, he would go in where no one else would go. The people with septic sores and the smell was so horrible, gangrene, that, that he would do it just as, as the highest type of, of, of worship. So anyhow, uh, M happened to be with her on that uh, pilgrimage to Varanasi. And they gave Holy Mother a tour of the hospital and everything. And she was thrilled to see the work that was done. These, because not just sick people, these are poor people who can't afford to go to a regular hospital. That uh, no money was taken from the, these the poor people. They were all served free of charge. So she said, Sri Ramakrishna is ever present in the place and Mother Lakshmi always casts her benign glance upon it. So later, when we, well, because M was there and the monks were there, one of the monks said to M, Mother has just told us that the activities of the home of service, Sevashram, were service to Sri Ramakrishna himself and that he was tangibly present here. Now what do you say? Then M replied with a laugh, and now how can I deny it anymore? Yeah. So do the words of, of Holy Mother. So if we, if we want to go back and, and just tweak this idea a little bit, 
What does it mean working for the welfare of the world? It means serving others as manifestation of God, serving with, with humility, serving with the understanding we're not going to change the world, understanding our limitations, uh, not having any pride or ego in, in what we do, to feel privileged to work and serve others, uh, and do everything in the spirit of self-sacrifice, not caring what happens to us, understanding this is the worship of living the living God, and highest type of worship, for at least for Swamiji. Highest. Doesn't mean that we don't do our meditation and other types of worship, but this was the, for Swamiji really living the living God. So we can see that uh, when we work for others, that we have to have this, this perfect uh, selflessness, not caring for what happens to us, not caring for our own liberation even, but when we sit for meditation, forget the world. At that time, forget the world, dive deep within, try to, to realize the divine presence within, to try to know who we really are. This will, be, this will enable us to be instruments to, to work for others and will also help others to, uh, as, as an example to them. So this is how these two principles work so beautifully together. Now, before I close, I wonder, I'll, I'll chant a verse from this Mahabharata about this uh, Ranti Deva. But I want to just briefly tell the story, a very nice story, that uh, once Vishnu was asked, uh, who was your greatest devotee? Now, it's not the story, the same story we know with uh, when the Narada asked, and he said that farmer. He said this king, Ranti Deva. And uh, they were all surprised, what's so great about him? So there's all the uh, other uh, celestial beings and everything. They went to see this king, and it was very generous and wonderful and devoted and everything, but they thought, let us test him. So uh, little by little, he started to lose everything. There was terrible famine there, and uh, people didn't have enough to eat. So he took the same vow that Swami Akandaranda took. And Swami Akandaranda looked upon him really as, as kind of an, I an ideal, that he, he wouldn't take any food as long as the others didn't have anything to eat. So one after another, finally they convinced him, you'll die if you don't take something. So he said, he'll take a little food. Then one by one, different people came, beggars and everything, and he shared his food. Finally, it's his outcast came, and uh, whatever little was left, he gave to him, and the little drinking water that he had, he gave to the dog that came with this, this outcast. Uh, and then all of the... Uh, other celestial beings there, they said yes. So this is why he's the greatest devotee of, of, of Vishnu. And this, this verse, I'll close with this verse, is attributed to him. This was the favorite verse of Swami Akhandanandaji. And this, this uh, Randi Deva was really uh, kind of an ideal for him. Natvaham kamaye rajyam naswargam na punar bhavam kamaye dukha taptanam Praninam arati nashanam. I don't care for any kingdom. I don't care for heaven. I don't care even for liberation from rebirth. The only thing I desire is that all beings who are being tortured, who are scorched by the, the misery of the world, that let their suffering come to an end. This is the only prayer that I have. So this really embodies this, this ideal of Swamiji, and somebody who has that, that type of attitude, they're free already. Yeah, this, this per perfect blending of these, these, this twin idea that we have. So let's stop here, and we can sit quietly for a few minutes. Mm -hmm.